The recovery position is the safest and most stable position for many emergency situations. It allows the person to breathe, permits fluids to drain from the mouth, and prevents stomach contents from being inhaled in case of vomiting. You're going to use the recovery position for any person who is breathing and unresponsive. Let's take a look at how to get someone into recovery position. Watch each step carefully. The whole procedure takes place in a few easy fluid movements. Remember that putting the person on their left side is generally preferable since that position can help reduce the chances of vomiting. First, extend the person's arm above their head. Position the person's other arm across their chest. Bend the person's leg at the knee. Put your forearm under the person's shoulder and your hand around the back of the neck to support the head and neck. Carefully roll the person away from you by pushing on their nearer knee and lifting with your forearm while your hand stabilizes the head and neck. The person's head is now supported on their raised arm. While continuing to support the head and neck, position the person's hand, palm down, with fingers under the armpit of the raised arm and with their forearm down flat at 90 degrees to the body. Bend both legs so the person is stabilized. Now that the person is in position, you can open their mouth to allow for drainage. You see, it's easy once you've seen Choking is a common emergency. In adults, choking usually happens while eating, and with children, while they're eating or playing. If the person is coughing and trying to expel the item on their own, don't interrupt. But if the person is in clear you? distress, clutches their throat, looks frantic, or signals that they're not getting enough air, then it's time to give first aid. Let's take the basic technique step by step. First thing, ask, are you choking? Are you choking? If the person cannot cough, speak, or breathe, quickly ask for consent to give first aid and have someone call 911. Can I help you? Next, stand behind the person with one leg forward between their legs to brace yourself. Locate the person's navel with a finger from one hand. Make a fist with the other hand and place the thumb side of the fist against the person's abdomen just above the navel. Grasp your fist with your other hand and thrust inward and upward into the abdomen with a quick motion. Keep this up until the person expels the object or becomes unresponsive. Can I help you? If the person you need to help is someone you can't get your arms around, or is pregnant, or when you can't effectively give abdominal thrusts, you can perform chest thrusts on the middle of the breastbone from behind the person. Take care not to squeeze their ribs with your arms. A person who is choking is not breathing and may soon become unresponsive. Have someone call 911 immediately. Lower the unresponsive person to the ground and start CPR by pumping the chest 30 times hard and fast. Continue CPR and check the mouth when you give breaths. Cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death all around the world, a disease that kills over 7 million people each year. We've all seen images of a classic heart attack, with a person grabbing their chest or experiencing pain along the arm. But it's not always so clear-cut. Here are some basic signs and symptoms to watch for. Persistent discomfort or a feeling of pressure in the chest. Pain that may spread to the neck, jaw, shoulders, or arms. Pale skin, sweating, shortness of breath, dizziness, or lightheadedness. Remember that not everyone has all these symptoms when having a heart attack, especially women. Let's look at a typical situation. Hi. Where are you going? You said I could. I never said that. If my room was clean, come on. And your homework was all done beforehand, before you went out. You never listen. You, you... I listen, you just keep changing the rules on me. Mom, I'll make a deal with you. Mom, what's wrong? Nothing, don't fuss, it's just, I just feel a little dizzy, that's all. Sit down, Mom, please. Now, how do you feel, really? 
They're not so good. I have some pressure in my chest and pain in my back and my jaw. It's weird, I just can't seem to get my breath. Loosen your sweater, oh. okay? Oh. It's just like they were talking about in health class. Oh. I can't believe, you could be having a heart attack. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Mom, listen, are you taking any heart medicine? Is there something you haven't told me? Honey, I do not have a heart condition. What are you doing? Calling 911. Oh, put the phone down. Yes, I think I have an emergency. I'm afraid my mom's having a heart attack. We live at 2301 Spring Drive, Wilmette. Yes, it's a house. My name is Ava Thomas. Yes, I'll give her an aspirin. Put the phone down. Mom, the paramedics are on the way. I'm gonna go get you an aspirin. Ava. Oh. Ava. I'm not feeling any real chest pain at all. Just a little discomfort. Honey, don't you think I'd know if I was having a heart attack? Just trust me. Chew this, don't swallow it. Whether it's chest discomfort, chest pain, or crushing pressure, the first aid you provide follows these steps. Call 911 or your local emergency number. Help the person rest by putting them in a position for easy breathing and loosening constrictive clothing. Ask if they're taking heart medication, and if so, help them use it if the directions say to. Encourage the person to chew one adult or two child dose aspirin, unless they're allergic. Stay with the person until help arrives. Be ready to give CPR if necessary, and do not let the person have anything to eat or drink, and that means you do not give them water with their aspirin. There are first aid situations where you'll need to control bleeding and care for a wound before help arrives. First, let's look at how to control bleeding. We're going to take you step by step through the technique of controlling bleeding with direct pressure. Put on medical exam gloves or improvise protection from contact with the person's blood if no gloves are available. Place a sterile dressing or clean cloth over the wound. Apply firm pressure directly on the gauze covered wound for about five minutes. Reevaluate the bleeding. If it continues, don't remove the dressing. Add more gauze and keep applying pressure. If needed, wrap an elastic or self-adhering bandage around the wound to maintain direct pressure to control bleeding. Wrap towards the body. You will know that pressure is sufficient if the bandage is snug, but a finger can be slipped under it. If appropriate, treat the person for shock and call 911. And remember that tourniquets are not recommended except as an extreme last resort because of the high risk of complications, and they should only be applied by rescuers trained in their use. Now we're going to show you the basics of wound care. To start with, wash your hands and wear gloves if available. Gently wash shallow wounds and abrasions with lots of warm or room temperature water, with or without soap to remove dirt. Irrigate a deeper wound under large amounts of running water to remove foreign matter. Do not use alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, or iodine on a wound. Pat the area dry. Apply antibiotic ointment only to an abrasion or superficial wound and only if the person is not allergic to it. Finally, cover the wound with a sterile dressing and bandage. Sometimes, proper cleaning and bandaging of the wound is enough. And sometimes, you need to seek further care. Have the person get medical attention if stitches may be needed. Wounds that may require stitches are cuts on the face and hands when the edges do not close together, gaping wounds, and cuts longer than one inch. Have the person get medical attention if they're not up to date with their tetanus vaccination. And remember that adults need a tetanus booster every 10 years. Also, seek medical attention if the wound later looks infected, if it's a deep wound or a puncture wound,
And of course, if an object is impaled in the wound. In that case, leave the object where it is, bandage around it, and get a... When people talk about going into a state of shock, they usually just mean extreme and unpleasant surprise. Medically, though, shock is a life-threatening emergency. Shock is most often caused by serious injury or sudden illness. And when people are in shock, not enough oxygen-rich blood is reaching their vital organs. So it's a critical situation. How do you recognize shock? What are the signs and symptoms to look for? Some of the signs of shock are visual. The skin is cool, clammy, or sweating, and it can be pale, bluish, or ashen in color. You may observe rapid, shallow breathing, nausea, or vomiting, extreme thirst, or changing levels of responsiveness. The person may display some symptoms by talking about or exhibiting dizziness or lightheadedness, anxiety, confusion, agitation, or restlessness. Any of these signs and symptoms alone or together can indicate shock. What do you do to administer first aid in a case of shock? To begin, check the person's responsiveness, breathing, and injuries. Call 911. Care first for life-threatening conditions such as extreme bleeding. Position a responsive person on their back using a blanket or coat as a pad. If there's no evidence of trauma, Raise the legs so the feet are 6 to 12 inches above the ground. Be sure to maintain the person's normal body temperature. Do not let the person eat, drink, or smoke. Stay with the person Stable. and offer reassurance and comfort. Burn injuries almost always require first aid, and it is the type of burn that determines what first aid steps to take. Burns are categorized in terms of severity by the depth of the burn. So, first-degree burns, such as sunburn, damage the skin's outer layer. The skin looks red, dry, and painful, and you'll see signs of swelling. Second-degree burns damage the next layer of skin. In addition to the skin being swollen and red, you'll observe blisters and signs of significant pain. Third-degree burns are the deepest and most severe. There will be damage such as charred, white, or leathery skin, and you may observe signs of shock. First aid treatment for all types of burns begins with removing the heat source. For first and second degree burns, cool down the burn area with cold running tap water until free from pain, even after removal from the water. It's important not to put ice on a burn, as ice can harm the skin tissue. Next. Remove constricting clothing or jewelry touching the burn before the area starts to swell. Call 911 in the case of large second-degree burns. Protect the burn area from friction or pressure with a non-stick dressing. Keep the dressing loose and, of course, do not tape it to the skin. Keep any burn blisters intact to reduce pain and improve healing by preventing infection. Finally, seek medical attention for burns on the face, genitals, hands, or feet. Third-degree burns require additional first aid, though several steps are the same. Remove the heat source, cool the burn with cold running tap water, remove constricting items, and call 911. In the case of a large burn, do not cover more than 20% of the body with water, and not more than 10% for a child, because of the risk of hypothermia and shock. Apply a loose nonstick dressing to the burn area and do not use cream or ointment. Two distinct types of burns you might encounter either in the workplace or at home are chemical burns and electrical burns. They require different first aid procedures. Chemical burns can be identified by seeing chemicals on skin or clothing, when the person complains of a pain or a burning sensation, when you see a spilled substance on or around an unresponsive person, or when there's a smell of fumes in the air. When dealing with a dry chemical, put on gloves and use cloth or cardboard to brush the chemical off the skin or clothing. If there is a chemical smell in the air, move away from the fumes and ventilate the area. Remove any clothing or jewelry from the burn area in case of swelling. 
Flush the skin as quickly as possible with running water until aid is available. If the chemical is in the eye, flush the eye with copious amounts of running water. You can use a specialized solution if there is one available. If you're irrigating without an eye wash station, tilt the head so water does not run into the other eye. Call 911. The final burn category we're looking at is electrical burns, and here you need to use extra caution. You suspect electrical burns when you observe burned areas of skin, possibly both entrance and exit wounds, and a source of electricity near the person such as bare wires, power cords, or an electrical device. The appearance of an electrical burn is no indicator of how serious it is. Electrical burns can look minor but still cause massive internal injuries. It's also important to protect yourself. When giving first aid, do not touch the person until you're certain the area is safe. If the source of the electrical shock is obvious, make sure that the power is off. Then call 911. Care for the burn by cooling down the area with water. Then remove any clothing or jewelry in contact with the burn and cover it loosely with a sterile dressing. If necessary, treat the person for shock. One important category of serious injury is a spinal injury, a fracture of the neck or back. Spinal injuries can result in permanent damage or death and require extreme care and caution. In first aid situations, there are a number of risk factors for potential spinal injury. Seniors and children over the age of two with neck or head trauma are vulnerable. When there is a bicycle or motor vehicle crash or a fall from more than the person's height or any painful injury, particularly of the head, neck, or back, spinal injury must be considered a possibility. If there are symptoms such as loss of feeling or tingling in hands or feet, pain in the back or neck, or muscle weakness, or impaired feeling in the torso or arms, or if the person is intoxicated or not alert, spinal injury needs to be suspected. Let's take a look at an example of a first aid situation with a possible spinal injury. That's what they said about the last order. <laughs> I'll believe it when it shows up in the warehouse. June. June, can you talk? Looks like you had a bad fall. What happened? I feel so dizzy. It's weird. I caught my heel. I don't see any injuries, but you're in pain, right? Mm, my neck. Don't move. Don't move. It's important to keep your neck and spine immobile. I've had first aid training. Is it okay if I help you? Sure. Primary care for suspected spinal cord injury is to hold the person's head with both hands to prevent movement of the head, neck, and spine. This is called spinal motion restriction. Can you get your breath okay? Yeah, I think I'm just freaked out, but my neck still hurts a Understandable. little. Understandable. I need you to keep still. Okay. Alice, June's had a fall. I need you to call 911 right away. Tell them it may be a spinal injury. I'd feel better if I could get off the floor. Can't I move at all? Better not. Let's do this by the book. That was a pretty bad fall. Ask a responsive person what happened and if there are any spinal injury risk factors. Explain the need to hold still to prevent spinal movement. With an unresponsive person, check for any suspected spinal injury risk factors. The key thing is to prevent movement. Using both hands, hold the person's head and neck in the position in which they were found. Monitor the person's breathing and be ready to provide CPR if needed. Have someone call 911. While you wait for help to arrive, reassure the person and tell them not to move. Continue to stabilize their head and spine and monitor the person's breathing. Injuries to bones, joints, and muscles are called musculoskeletal injuries, and this type of injury frequently requires first aid. A fracture or broken bone can be identified by a deformed or dysfunctional body part swelling or discolored skin, or an exposed bone. The person may have heard the bone snap, may be unable to use the limb, and may be showing signs of pain or shock. With a dislocation, a bone or bones at the joint get displaced from their normal position when ligaments holding the bones in place are torn. The joint is often deformed and can't be used, 
there's swelling and signs of pain. Sometimes it's hard to tell a severe sprain from a fracture, but it's not necessary to know the exact injury in order to give first aid. Call 911 for a large bone fracture or dislocation, except those on the hand or finger. To give first aid for fractures and dislocations, immobilize the area in the position it was found. In the case of an extremity, also immobilize the joints above and below the fracture. A person with a hand or foot fracture may be splinted and taken directly to the emergency department. In the case of a large bone fracture, call 911 or the local emergency number or shout for help and get someone else to call. With an open fracture, use a sterile dressing to cover the wound. If you need to control bleeding, apply gentle pressure around the fracture area. Do not use a constriction bandage with an open fracture because it has the potential to cause more damage. There is a general first aid procedure you can use with most musculoskeletal injuries. It's known by its acronym, RICE. R is for rest, I is for ice, C is for compression, and E is for elevation. First, rest. Do not move the injured area. If help is expected soon, splinting is usually not necessary. But if help is delayed, splint the injury to keep the area immobile and keep the bone or joint from becoming worse. Second, ice. Place a plastic bag or damp cloth with an ice water mix on the injured area to reduce swelling and lessen the pain. Put a barrier, a cloth for example, between the plastic bag and the skin. You can also use a cold pack. Apply the cold for 20 minutes, 10 if it causes discomfort. Then remove it for 30 minutes. Repeat the process for 24 to 48 hours or until medical help is obtained. Third, compression. Use an elastic bandage on the injured extremity to reduce internal bleeding and swelling. The bandage can be wrapped over an ice water bag. Finally, elevation. Elevate the injured extremity to keep down the swelling and reduce possible internal bleeding. A sling may be used for arm injuries. You can splint any injury in danger of harm from movement if help will take a while to arrive. And you do splint a hand or foot injury if the person has to be taken to the The term sudden illness covers a range of conditions that can require first aid. Some of their signs and symptoms and the first aid steps to take are similar. The person may feel generally ill, dizzy, confused, or weak. You may observe sweating, a change in skin color, or the person may suffer from nausea or vomiting. Even if you're not able to determine the cause of the illness, you can still take these first aid steps. Call 911. Help the person rest and keep their body temperature stable, not chilled or overheated. Reassure the person and don't give them anything to eat or drink until emergency aid arrives. Watch the person for changes and be prepared to give basic life support as needed. Asthma is a chronic respiratory disease that is on the rise all over the globe, affecting some 100 million people worldwide. If not properly treated, asthma can be fatal. So it's an essential part of first aid to understand asthma signs and symptoms. Here's an example of what an asthma attack can look like. What's your best time, Zach? What's the problem? Pizza, cake, soft drinks for lunch? And Alex, are you swimming in your sleep? I've warned you guys before, this keeps happening. We're... Zach. It's his asthma. Where's your inhaler? Don't worry. If this doesn't work, we'll call 911. Typical asthma attack signs and symptoms include wheezing, difficulty breathing and speaking, a dry persistent cough, gray-blue skin, fear and anxiety, and changing levels of responsiveness. Try and hold it for a good 10 seconds. <coughs> that do the trick? You've seen them this bad before? This is nothing. Okay, kid, just breathe. 
An asthma inhaler should be used as directed by the prescription or the medical provider. Usually that means one to two doses or puffs as needed. If difficulty with breathing continues, however, call 911 without delay. And if the person doesn't know they have asthma because it's their first attack, or if they don't have their medication with them, call 911 or your local emergency number. A stroke is a sudden illness brought on by constricted blood supply to the brain. When that blood supply is reduced or interrupted, the brain tissue is deprived of oxygen and the brain cells begin to die. Stroke is always a medical emergency, and prompt first aid can help minimize damage and save lives. It's crucial to quickly recognize the signs and symptoms of stroke and call for help right away. It's going to be the best party ever. World. The term diabetes encompasses a group of related diseases characterized by blood sugar levels not well regulated by the body. The blood sugar can be unnaturally low or high. With low blood sugar, you will observe dizziness, shakiness or mood change, pale skin and sweating, and the person may report headache, confusion, hunger, or difficulty paying attention. At the extreme end, the person with low blood sugar may have a seizure. With high blood sugar, you may notice the person is short of breath, has deep rapid breathing, breath that smells fruity or nausea and vomiting, the person may experience frequent urination, drowsiness, dry mouth and thirst, and eventual unresponsiveness. Diabetic emergencies are common and require immediate first aid care. Let's take a look at a typical situation. Uh, what more can we do, right? I hate to say it, but this staying late every night isn't going to cut it. Oh, I hear you. We could do this all year and still look bad. It's the productivity metrics. I don't know where they got the data to start with, but it's just killing us. I mean, we need a meeting. Am I right? You look awful, man. What's going on? <sighs> Stupid. I got busy, forgot to eat. It gives me the shakes sometimes. It's a blood sugar problem. You mean diabetes? Yeah. My dad has diabetes. You have any sugar on you? Anything? Those uh, glucose tabs? I ran out. Here, let's set you down. Okay. Just uh, give me a minute. I think I have a candy bar somewhere. You should never run out, it's dangerous. My dad told me he'll be I said give me a it. minute! I swear I get enough of this at home. Here, try this. I'm gonna run to the vending machine and get you some juice. Just take a minute. Will you be okay? I'll be fine. All right, if you're not better after the juice, I'm calling 911. Oh, no, no arguments. It's difficult to know if a diabetic problem is caused by low or high blood sugar. If the person has low blood sugar, give three glucose tablets or a half cup of fruit juice. One to two sugar packets, not a non-sugar sweetener, or five to six pieces of hard candy. High blood sugar is a true medical emergency. If you suspect high blood sugar, call 911 immediately and monitor the person. But if you're unsure whether it's high or low blood sugar, it's okay to give the person sugar. If the person has high blood sugar, this won't cause additional harm. Just remember to monitor them and call 911 if their symptoms persist. Allergic shock requires separate treatment when it comes to first aid. Anaphylaxis is an extreme allergic reaction typically caused by insect stings, drugs such as penicillin or sulfa, foods like peanuts, shellfish or eggs, or even substances that just touch the skin, like latex. You can identify anaphylactic shock by signs and symptoms such as difficulty breathing or swallowing wheezing, complaints of tightness in the throat or chest, flushed skin, swelling of the face and neck, anxiety, agitation, nausea and vomiting, and changing levels of responsiveness. Now let's walk through the first aid step that's unique to dealing with allergic shock reaction. Using the auto-injector epinephrine kit, such as the EpiPen. First, Call 911 for a serious allergic reaction. An epinephrine auto-injector is a simple yet powerful life-saving device. People with allergic conditions often carry their epinephrine auto-injectors with them. It's best if the person can administer their own injection. But if the person is unable, and if your state law permits, you can administer epinephrine using an auto-injector such as the EpiPen. Take the pen out of its case and remove the cap. 
To administer the medication, jab the pen tip into the person's outer thigh. Hold the pen there for 5 to 10 seconds while the medication is being injected. The medication should provide relief for 15 to 20 minutes. In the meantime, it's important for you to stay with the person until emergency professionals arrive. This is a simple skill to learn, administering epinephrine, but knowing it could save someone's life. There's a simple rule of thumb on when to call the Poison Control Center in case of poisoning. If the person is responsive, call the Poison Control Center. If the person has signs of a life-threatening condition or is unresponsive, call 911. Put any breathing unresponsive person 